Good evening. If I could have your attention, please. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Anne Dell. I'm head of the department sorry, of life sciences. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Um, a particularly warm welcome to all of our visitors from outside the college, uh, especially friends and family, uh, Jasper's wife Flo, who I believe is sitting there, and friends and family, many of whom have come from some distance. I know that there's people who have come across the seas to get to us. Also a warm welcome to everyone from the college, uh, staff and students from the college. So I do need to start with a tiny bit of housekeeping. There will not be a fire alarm test this evening. <laughs> so if you hear the fire alarm, please exit via the exits at the back here. And the assembly point is Exhibition Road at the front of the building. So from my perspective, this kind of evening is, I think, pretty much one of the most favorite things that any head of department can do, chairing the inaugural lectures, because they're really quite special. They're the opportunity of a, a newly or relatively newly promoted professor, because it often takes a year or so to get the inaugurals uh, organized, to talk about not only their science, but also, to some extent, their personal and professional journeys to the uh, stardom of professorial position at Imperial College. And I am hoping that Jasper will uh, be like uh, his predecessors uh, and actually tell us something about his life as well as, obviously, his science. So my pleasure is to say a little bit about Jasper in terms of his background and how he got to us, and then I will be rapidly handing over, so I'm not going to take up too much of his time. So Jasper started his research career at the University of Amsterdam. He did his undergraduate degree there in chemistry, uh, finishing in, uh, let me check, nine, oh, his master's in 1995 and his PhD in 1999. He then did a very brief postdoc at, in Berlin and in Amsterdam, and then moved to the University of Oxford to uh, Louise Johnson's laboratory of molecular biophysics. And he was able, in a very short period of time, which was pretty remarkable, to be successful in highly competitive composition, uh, competitions for prestigious fellowships. And he was very greedy, finished up with three in the space of a couple of years, from EMBO and the Human Frontier Science Program, and also from the Royal Society. So these fellowships obviously exemplified not only the stellar nature of his research, but also in particular what he was doing. He was essentially deciding he wanted to do things that no one else could do at the time, and that he wanted to create technology, and he wanted to bring together technology and ideas. And this is pretty unusual with people at that stage. And not surprising, therefore, Imperial had an eye on him, and he was kind of poached to, become, to come to Imperial as a reader in 2007, I think, um, in the Division of Molecular Biosciences in the Department of Life Sciences. And he very rapidly, with help of the college and research councils, established an ultra-fast spectroscopy lab in the life sciences department, which again is quite unusual to have that kind of technology embedded in the life sciences. But it did mean that Jasper could immediately start engaging with the bioscience that he could apply his technology to. So the word which essentially equates Jasper with his science is femtosecond, and I'm expecting that every member of the audience knows what a femtosecond is. I didn't really know. I had to look it up. So another word of, uh, way of describing a femtosecond is to say it's a quadrillionth of a second. That didn't kind of help me either. So I decided to do what the web does, which is to say that 10 to the minus 15 of a second is, for the ordinary people in the audience, including me, a millionth of a billionth of a second. So what Jasper is able to do is to capture images in that kind of time frame. And what that means is that he can then observe uh, complex molecules like proteins, uh, the basis of life, as it were. He can observe what they are doing in real time, which is pretty amazing. So 
I'm not going to say any more because, as you can tell, I really know very little about femtoseconds spectroscopy. Jasper will tell you all about that. I just want to emphasize that not only is Jasper a superb scientist, but he's also a great ambassador for science. So he has, and the audience, I think, exemplifies this, networks of collaborators across the world. He also is involved in major consortia activities, for example, using, exploiting the capabilities of the hard X-ray free electron laser in Stanford. And it is very clear from his publications, from his dozens of invitations to international meetings, that he's very, very widely respected worldwide. I also want to highlight that he has spearheaded closer to home, and I know there's quite a few people in the audience who are linked to that, the establishment of a new center at Imperial College or a network at Imperial College to bring together all of the activities across college in this general area of really fast stuff, dynamics. And that I know that there are people here from physics and maths and chemistry and elsewhere, and you are very, very welcome to this inaugural. So Jasper's outstanding achievements were deservedly recognized by the uh, Promotions Committee of the College to promotion to Professor of Molecular Biophysics in 2017. The Promotions Panel praised the breadth, depth, and quality of your multidisciplinary research, Jasper. They also pra praised the splendid contributions that Jasper makes to all other areas of academic life, particularly his uh, passion for supporting students. So Jasper goes the extra mile to support our students, uh, both in terms of mentoring and supporting them to do projects. And in all respects, Jasper is an exemplary academic. So I am therefore delighted to invite you, Jasper, to deliver your inaugural lecture. The title is up here, but I'll read it out. Uh, entitled, Molecular Movies, Capturing the Ultrafast Structural Dynamics of Life. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. This was your slide, um, so there it is, and it's gone. Um, <coughs> firstly, now, life is very obviously dynamic. It's incredibly dynamic. And today I will tell you about the creation of different types of molecular movies. And what they are is using and developing techniques um, techniques that we now have available in order to watch ultra-fast structural reactions that are fundamental to life. That's my goal today. My story is about motion. And the first thing to say about motion is that it's everywhere. It happens in semiconductors as much as it happens in in living organisms, it's indistinguishable in its nature. I have some nice echoes here. That's better. Can you still hear me? Ah, without the, yeah. Um, it's indistinguishable, the type that motion exists. Motion exists in apparently stationary objects. It happens in very cold molecules, in what we call their zero point energy. Now, if we zoom in from macroscopic dimensions that we can see with our eyes into microscopic dimensions to dimensions of particles that are very light, then we describe motion differently. There, motion is wave-like in nature. We need quantum mechanics. And uh, the study of motion of proteins, um, I'm still echoing a little bit, Excuse me. <clears throat> the study of motions of proteins is actually in the quantum domain. But practically, we tend to work across the boundary of the classical and the quantum domain. Uh, and that is, um, that's the nature of our research. A picture says more than a thousand words. And moving pictures, they speak to us even more strongly. And we, as humans, we are incredibly visual creatures. Just by watching something going on, we infer meaning, we develop understanding, and 
our brains even predict the short-term outcome, whether in science or in cinema. <coughs> Dryly said, in our brains we have very powerful image processing circuitry, and we also have something that is essentially a evolved intuition for motion that allows us to understand it. And for today, I would like to coin a term and call this our innate physics engine. We all have one. This high jumper is an exquisite control of his trajectory. His brain is computing on the fly the time derivative of his momentum, the position derivative of potential energy, and he adjusts its internal coordinates so that his center of mass passes underneath the bar. Having evolved on Earth, we are very clumsy in other environments where gradients are modified, as you can see this chap on the moon bouncing around. Understanding life and the motion of life is not something unique to us, it's an evolved trait. It's essential for survival, local motion as well as motion, but um, it, I, would, I would put that motion is in fact part of the very definition of existence of life. That's, that's what I put to you. There's plenty of evidence of our physics engines at work on this planet prior to the development of mathematics and mechanics. You just have to look at ancient architecture and engineering as an example that required understanding of forces and also motion, namely vibration. In the year 55 BC, Julius Caesar invaded uh, the Germanic lands and he did this by telling his uh, army engineers to build him a bridge 400 meters long across the Rhine at a site near Koblenz. They did this being Romans in the space of 10 days and Julius Caesar marched across his army of 30,000 soldiers. Now these Romans, they knew what they were doing. History shows the result. Um, more specifically, they, they knew how to construct this bridge <coughs> to prevent low frequency vibration that could be driven otherwise to large amplitude resonantly with potentially disastrous consequences when marching across 30,000 soldiers instead. This didn't happen because Caesar invaded Germany indeed. And this was a lesson perhaps needed to be relearned in 2000 with the opening of the Millennium Bridge. <laughs> and you can see it going on here. It started to sway immediately. What happened that spontaneously, rather than isolated oscillators, pedestrians started to march in step. And this is, this is understood to be through the physical process of mode coupling involving a allowed low frequency mode of the bridge that was driven resonantly to a large amplitude. I wager these engineers did not read Gallic Wars. <coughs> Our physics engines were satisfied with the creation of the field of mechanics. And it originates with Isaac Newton in the 17th century and culminates in quantum mechanics. For my undergraduate lectures, I stick to the top row. I hardly need to leave the 17th and 18th centuries. So much was done uh, during that time. I want to tell you that as a kid, I was fascinated by mechanics. I imagined that tiny motions in the brain of molecules, that they were eventually responsible for human consciousness, for our thinking, and therefore the creation of the arts and the sciences as a child in school. And it's incredibly difficult to visualize sort of the imaginings of 15-year-old self. But I have attempted. We are miracles of molecular complexity. We truly are. We are intricate assemblies of macromolecules in two cells, into tissues, into organs, all of which move with purpose into fully living and conscious human beings. When we enter the cell, we in enter an environment that's incredibly crowded, and it's also dynamical, filled with molecules that are proteins. 
And these are dynamic, and it's proteins with which we see, proteins that beat your heart, and proteins that combust your food to give you the energy that you need. At this length scale, we observe two types of motions. There is firstly vibration, seen in this little animation uh, made in a computer, but there's also purposeful motion with the application of thermodynamics that we are interested in. The connection be between the two exists, but it shows a level of complexity. This animation shows that a single macromolecule protein can move in tens of thousands of different ways. And it's this landscape that, we, that our degrees of freedom dimensions that must be accessed with application of thermodynamic driving force to choose a path which seems a miraculous level of complexity already. These simulations, they are very crude approximations. They're mostly wrong. Um, one reason is that also they neglect electronic structure, which is directly coupled to nuclear configuration. And, um, and this is presenting us with a potentially even more challenging question. And I will come back to this point. We know from our friends who work on so-called electron correlation that for them, the CH4 methane molecule in vacuum is a very, very, very large problem indeed. So it seemed to me uh, that the understanding the motion of a protein, let alone the locomotion of the, of the organism, represents a level of complexity almost metaphysical in nature. Most people will probably be able to mention a person some, who at some point inspired them to follow a certain path. Um, for me, this was not my school teachers, but it was what I read in the textbook. I was so impressed by the laws of Newton that I found that I hitchhiked to Amsterdam because my pocket money didn't stretch to a train ticket um, to visit the academic library of the University of Amsterdam as a 15-year-old. And I arrived successfully. I uh, searched their, uh, all, all the, the contents of the library, and I found, to my surprise, they had a copy of Principia there. My surprise was even bigger than when I was asked to see it. I was allowed, and I was led into this beautiful 18th century library uh, reading room, and it was filled with intimidating academics. And there it was. His Latin was terrible. <laughs> and uh, he would actually publish optics later in, uh, in English. But I was able to find the, uh, the sections that I was looking for on gravitational acceleration. Uh, it had a beautiful diagram. And I copied these out and took them home and translated them uh, myself. Uh, but I, I remember well that at that very point in time, at that place, I committed to to the study of motion. And not only that, I committed to the academic method, being so impressed having worked among academics for an entire afternoon. I also decided to study either physics or chemistry. That was also the correct, um, correct uh, uh, answer. Um, and and, and I, I think somehow the point here is that without much benefit of knowledge, I somehow asked exactly the correct question. Because I've been doing it ever since. I'm doing it today. And I can tell you I will continue to do it um, in, uh, from now on. So that is the, um, something I want to give you. And I want to share with you some highlights of this journey uh, today. And before I do that, I must clarify something in the title. I must clarify the use of, oops, wrong one, of ultrafast. What is ultrafast? There isn't one simple um, answer to this, but it's important. And one of them goes like this. Imagine a system of particles. And they can be electrons. They can be atoms in molecules. And if I now expose these to very brief, very intense laser pulse, they will start to swing. If they swing together, 
they are in phase, and we call this coherence. Imagine now that this system evolves to, to be productive, then you can imagine that the true motion can be seen in the presence of coherence. If we wait longer than do the environment, they will no longer have phase relationship. If this system now evolves to create a product, all we will see is differences in concentration in the time of observation. And that leads to an essential separation in time scales specific to molecular physics. It's a little bit like um, waking up in the passenger seat at your destination and having no idea the, the route that was taken. And this is, for us, the compelling reason to always push for the femtosecond time domain, which are the relevant timescales for electronic and nuclear motion. I hope that uh, explains that part. Um, now, I was very fortunate as a student to find at the University of Amsterdam a professor who did exactly what I was interested in, Klaas Henlingwerf. He uh, used physical chemistry to study biological questions about activated systems. And I spent much of my undergraduate and graduate years there. And I specialized in molecular spectroscopy during that time. Um, and I just want to say that, that Klaas was able to create an environment for us it was almost a playground, it would be a veritable sandpit for us to play and grow and experience, and I thank him for that a lot. Um, that was a great time. You can tell that I had a very good time uh, right there. We uh, all looked like this in Amsterdam in 1993, indeed. Uh, but at least I had very good role models, uh, of course. And, uh, and yes, and future plans. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I knew what I wanted. And of course, in those days, uh, quantum mechanics explained everything. You just had to, to write the correct Hamiltonian. <laughs> but seriously, um, during the time with class, I worked on photo photosynthesis, and specifically on photosystem one, which is one of these blobs. Um, this is how we thought about photosynthesis during the time. It's been replaced since, not during my time, with explicit structures. So it's the same picture, but now shapes of these proteins in there. And I worked on electron transport. And the importance of photosynthetic uh, uh, function and the research was not lost on me. It was a huge field, massive field. And I went to the international conferences. And, um, and, and it still is. But I was to leave photosynthesis for some time, and re I've returned to it in recent years, but my attention was caught by a jellyfish, which sounds esoteric. For 20 years, it was an extremely esoteric area of science. Um, a protein from a jellyfish that glows, um, and uh, as an animation here, very few people were working in it until one key discovery was made in the late 90s. The gene was cloned, and it was shown that when fed to bacteria or, or worms, that they spontaneously became fluorescent. And that allowed an, an explosion of, of new applications in biology. And suddenly it wasn't esoteric, suddenly it was very important, but for me it meant I could get the material myself, and I could watch it fluoresce. On the left, there's the, um, there's the fluorescence uh, photocyte. We know time scales are nanoseconds. Color change is something I discovered after illuminating for some time. I observed it was green and then yellow. Aha, I have made the protein move. I like that. I like that a lot. And, um, and so I was a PhD student. But, um, and moreover, I was able to make vibrational spectroscopy measurements. I won't show the spectra, but suddenly I could see from the multitude of dimensions, degrees of freedoms, spectrally resolved, you can measure individual motions. These are pictures of molecules moving in distinct ways, and th their properties of each motion is seen separately by the method of controlling the conversion. 
and I was hooked. This would determine everything. This was all steady state. During those years, ultra-fast application was being developed in Munich and Pennsylvania, but not in Amsterdam. But fast forward a couple of years, and I was doing it. I was by now at Oxford University, and I worked at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, and I was making these kinds of measurements where I could see the very same molecular motions, but now with ultra-fast time scale response, I had arrived in heaven. Um, and yes, I, I then, at this time, I was studying the fluorescence photocycle. And I made a discovery here that would determine everything that happened next. Um, I, I, I was looking at the transformations in this fluorescence. I was studying a quantum mechanical motion, hydrogen tunneling motion in uh, a hydrogen bonding network. And I was observing it twice. I was observing it uh, both on fast, ultra-fast timescales, but one faster than the other. And I realized from the spectra that these were different structures. Now, this method doesn't measure structure. You need density functional theory. But if, when, when I used density functional theory, I concluded that the differences in these structures were absolutely minute. They differed in fractions of fractions of bond angles. They differed in less than picometer bond distances. Yet they determined the quantum tunneling dynamics. And I realized that the go-to method to measure molecular structure, which is X-ray crystallography, is incapable of measuring these things. Vibrational spectroscopy is far superior for this question. On the other hand, vibrational spectroscopy doesn't see everything. If you want to see the whole molecule, you must use the X-ray method. And there was only one solution to both. And so we've done, this is a mainstream method, still used in my lab. And the point is that you must always choose the method appropriate to the molecular function that you are studying, and one isn't enough. The importance of uh, discovery of the green fluorescent protein was, uh, was, was recognized with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. A highlight for me was the invitation to the special issue in ChemSoc Reviews. Uh, that, um, that was in honor of the 2008 Nobel Prize. You can see that by now. I was embarrassed to have my picture taken, and my hair was getting progressively shorter. <clears throat> After my PhD, then, I made a decision to make a very drastic change in direction, and I wrote to Louise Johnson at Oxford University. I wrote, Dear Professor Johnson, I would like to learn X-ray crystallography and apply to dynamical problems and look at problems that I've so far seen with molecular spectroscopy. I enclose a, a detailed research proposal, yours. And I, I'll never forget the very next day, by return mail, I was holding in my hand a letter from Louise. Dear Dr. Van Thor, this sounds splendid. Please go ahead. <laughs> and the rest is history, I guess. Louise was wonderful. And <clears throat> She really was. She, she was extremely supportive. She enabled me to do anything that I wanted. That was also unusual for the Laboratory of Molecular Biophysics. Um, and, and she en really enabled that. And I'm extremely grateful to Louise for this. And it's something I will really never, ever forget. The first thing I did at Oxford was look into what is actually this color change mechanism. I discovered something strange, the most unusual mechanism ever, because I'm not aware of any occurrence prior or since. It's a case where an optically excited state acts as an oxidant. For some experts here, you will agree that this is very unusual in this protein. It leads to a radical mechanism that, but that, that actually I'm showing it because it's one of these things that from uh, primary interests leads to applications in unexpected places. This is a reaction that's been exploited to very great effect in a very different field called super-resolution microscopy. They use this. I want to introduce time-resolved X-ray crystallography. It's a field that was single-handedly created by one guy, Keith Moffat, at the University of Chicago. He 
the late 90s, in quick succession, he demonstrated two pump and probe differences, time resolution, nanoseconds, meaning we measure concentration, not motion, but it established the technique. And so he is the father of, um, of the field. Now, like this crystal of quartz, this crystal of quartz, proteins can be made to crystallize in symmetrical arrangements. And in this crystalline arrangement, you can use X-ray crystallography as a technique to measure and determine the structure that usually does not have time resolution. And so the, the field of macromolecular crystallography that provides static structures is huge. Today, there's over 100,000 published in the literature crystal structures. It is a massive industry. But then the ratio of 20,000 to 1 for time resolved is being maintained to this very day. In 2006, I was in front of the very first ERC committee in Brussels, and I said to them, I want to find out why it's 20,000 times harder. And secondly, I want to see if this method can be applied to femtosecond time domain to measure motion. And uh, the short answer to the first question is that it's always optical, always. The crystallography can always be solved. The bars on the left show that. The crystallography, even in special time resolved mode, is not, is not the problem. It's always optical and photochemical, and this is what we've been specializing in ever since. That's the key to successful experiment. Uh, I was also, I, I would also find that Keith had plucked some Wonderful fruit, but um, any remaining fruit was very high hanging indeed. Um, I did do it and established a, a third experiment uh, that needs perfect crystals. These were developed by NASA for their space program, and they worked for this white radiation method. Um, but at this point, I want to introduce something very important. That's a fourth generation light sources or X-ray free electron lasers. I found in my archives in 2001 inbox the technical design reports for Tesla Hamburg and for the linear coherent light source in 2002. There was going to be a wait of quite some years. Stanford got there first. They got there first because they were visionary. That's one, but also the site of the discovery and first demonstration of, of free electron lasers at lower energies. And these are billion dollar machines that are linear accelerators with a laser attached to them. And this animation from Slack shows uh, at the end of it the mechanism by which uh, this machine works. It is in fact a, um, uh, a relativistic machine. Electrons are accelerated with an energy of 15 giga electron volts. Therefore, electrons travel at near speed of light. The relativistic mass increases. This is the Lorentz factor to very high value. And here, the animation tries to show that this relativistic effect causes the field emission with wavelengths far shorter than the undulator period, which is the, which is the whole key relativistic machine. Uh, part in this lasing process, self-amplified stimulated emission, is, um, is this micro-bunching that's animated right there in slices through loss and gain processes, the result of which is we have a super bright femtosecond flash of hard x-rays that can be used for structure measurement. And we've been waiting for that since 2001. I'm preparing for it, and in 2010 we had first been, and I was there. I've been working there ever since. Um, there's many questions we had to answer in the first years. Can we even use this source for quality X-ray crystallography to measure differences? You can also imagine that, um, if I just go back, that the, um, this is a three kilometer long instrument. The injection laser fires there but the experiment is there. It's a different laser that illuminates your crystals. It's three kilometers away. If the Earth heats by one degree, the photons arrive 100 picoseconds later, which is an extremely long time. So we were faced with many, many, many difficulties, like the shot-to-shot -shot arrival time measurements. This took many years. 
all of these things can be solved. And Keith Moffat and I, in collaboration in 2015, for the first time, recorded the first crystal structures of a protein in a, an electronic excited state with femtosecond time resolution, our goal. And these are snapshots zooming in on the dye molecule in the center of a photoreceptor protein, similar to what happens in your eye. Then uh, the, the, the sensing of a photon is transmitted biologically through this primary structure change. And the chicken wire here shows basically the motion where electron density disappears and appears. And we are seeing on early timescales the assignment was the, the, the structure on the, on the left there is electronic excited and then that's, that's a ground state product that's a twisted conformation. And this was very important, first demonstration. But I mentioned that the, the challenges are always optical. The problem is this. We want to see how this thing works under the sun because that's what it's evolved for. But if we want time resolution, we need to illuminate it 700 times more bright. And this has two effects. Firstly, we drive nonlinear undesired artifacts, multi-photon absorptions. Um, and secondly, we create vibrational coherence just like the Millennium Bridge. And the, the second one we are dealing with by writing theory and making predictions, but I will show you evidence actually in a moment that's brand new. And the first one we've actually approached by extensive spectroscopy and, and shaping of the light. Um, we worked for years in order to design the laser field that was eventually used during the experiment where this is a picture of the device we built on the spot to prove that we had that, that we had the field. Um, and that allowed us to make um, basically the measurement I've just shown. Now, I should show you some movies, right? That's what you're here for. Um, and uh, the latest and greatest is always the most fun. And I have brand new results to share with you. And this resulted from uh, beam times in Japan and Stanford, uh, 2016, 17, and 18. Um, and I literally calculated the definitive results two weeks ago um, after 10 months of processing. Um, after building the experiment in a very professional manner, <laughs> um, this is then an impression of what we have. All our instruments are hooked up to controls. We see data coming in, diffraction data on the left. And this is our femtosecond ti arrival timing system that has femtosecond resolution as we go along, for which we have to stamp, time stamp each measurement. And so it's highly technical. You can imagine that we need large teams to do all these tasks. We uh, need to, to build the optics um, and copy what we do at, at home. Um, the uh, sample delivery is, is one thing, and then the analysis. And they are, they are massive undertakings that we prepare for for many months. And, um, and that is, um, the, I'm going to show you results from the bottom uh, experiment that was particularly successful. We are looking at the fluorescent protein, by now familiar to you. And this is the way we re represent it. We zoom in. In that chromophore, there is a cluster of hydrogen bonded groups. And this cluster we see must move in order to allow the color change. And the movie is here. There. It goes. These are the signals with the time delays after the laser arrival, as you see on the top. And that is one level of molecular moving. And after one picosecond, or relatively long time, uh, our experiment stopped. Um, now, we discovered recently that this happens faster than the speed of sound, which is 350 meters a second in air. And it's 2.3 kilometers a second in protein crystals. And it's just a wave from propagation of atoms banging into each other. So I'm going to show you the movie again. But now I'm going to show you a gray sphere, which is the wave front of the speed of sound in the molecule, uh, where uh, it translates to 23 angstroms 
per picosecond. So there it comes again. Watch the gray sphere. And it's fine. It's supersonic. And this is what we expected based on spectroscopy. It's driven by electronic change. The source is not the chromophore only. And it's the propagation through the hydrogen bonding network and the charge density differences that, that we can now observe. Uh, we go to the site of action, the site of, um, of, of dynamics. Uh, this is where everything is triggered at the phenolic end of the chromophore. It's the same data. And we see oscillations appearing where red is negative and blue is gain. So that's the motion that we see. And there are some oscillations happening. Uh, and it seems to be over with a um, net motion to the right of water and protein groups. And the time scale for these motions is precisely what we expect for this millennium bridge type moving. Um, and we can prove this now. I've been saying for a long time that uh, it's the light that determines everything. The laser field is everything on these time scales. The origin of motion is different. We take methods from coherent control. You can do it in two ways. You can shape the light or you can use two, two sources, and that's the one we did. Um, so we use two sources, and on the left is a single interaction, on the right is a double interaction, and we see essentially the same thing with single interaction, but much far less extended and much weaker. This also fits with our assignment. This is the first ever demonstration of cohesion control observed by crystallography. And I'm very happy to share it with you, something so brand new. Um, I want to carry on and tell you one, give you one more message, because I said even more challenging in the structure dynamics is that of electrons, valence electrons. I cannot use crystallography to see it. The method doesn't detect it. We must use something else. And when I joined Imperial College, uh, it was Jim Barber who uh, enticed me to work on Photosystem II. And this is his fantastic structure that has had such an amazing impact in, uh, in the field. And he had these, these wonderful crystals. And I saw an opportunity to combine ultrafast spectroscopy and crystallography to try and make movies of electronic dynamics. I started this in 2009, when we had the first laser systems um, purchased for this work. Unique instrumentation explicitly built for measurements on oriented single crystals. Uh, the measurements didn't take that long, a few years, but it was the theory, actually, that consumed our time. Um, and with an oriented single crystal of this type, you, um, you can make an analysis based on on the real space orientation of the molecule. Uh, we were using theoretical physics calculations that are necessary at this level to see what you expect to test experiment. These are movies now by, it's called dens density matrix calculations of the single pigments, the chlorophyll A's, as it participates in the harvesting of the light. So the light comes in, it's absorbed in plants, then the energy must pass, is passed around. Eventually, it gets to the center, and bang, that's where we charge our battery, which is the charge separation. That's the process we are looking at on fast timescales in plants. So on the left is, in fact, after years of theory and work, the first experiment on um, a structurally resolved electronic dynamics. This is a snapshot at zero femtoseconds. Um, but uh, they are a particular type of amplitude. And this, for the first time, combined ultrafast spectroscopy with, um, with crystallography and coordinate analysis. And this is very exciting to us. It's a new technique that hasn't been available. Very proud of it. that It, it was developed at Imperial College uh, completely independently and first shown. And where this field is going, I'm very excited. The next step is to see the coherent motion of electrons. That is our next goal. And I'm going to show you a funky slide, um, which is this one. So <coughs> there was a guy called Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman 
he, he, um, he worked in, uh, in quantum electro electrodynamics, and he came up with a way to draw diagrams to show what is going on. So we don't have to look at gray equations. For me, they, they, are, they are pictures of equations. That's what it is. But these pictures, they engage our physics engines. When we look at them, we see the path and we see the motion. And I'm showing this level of uh, Feynman diagrams for the um, coherent motions of electrons because this is the level where we can separate the coherent amplitudes and I've now developed and shown the theory for how we can do this in, uh, in, in coherent motion for electronics. In, in this picture, the theory is done, and so now our next challenge, which is where we are, is to do it experimentally, and we're in the middle of this. And I believe this is going to be a very, very promising new area of molecular movies uh, that we must do separately. I should also say that um, very often research done for reasons of curiosity, which is just fundamental research. We do it be because we want to develop these things. They can have unexpected applications. I've seen this of my, for my own work many times, but sometimes it's your duty to go out and actually find uh, applications for them. And this is what we are doing at the moment. Um, we believe that the methods we have developed for crystal, optical crystallography can be applied to solar cell research, and the human race may well depend on it. Uh, we, the, the solar energy is going to be essential to our survival in the next millennia, and, and we, it's our duty to, to not wait for others to apply our, our method developments, but we're actually going actively out pursuing it. And this is something I, I very much want to do, uh, but it's a very new direction uh, for us. Now, I think in summary, I think I've shown you that there isn't one solution to uh, the problem of measuring motion. There isn't one. We must use multiple and different techniques. Uh, I've also shown you that I'm an incredibly selfish person to satisfy the curiosity of a 15-year-old uh, child, but uh, that's in fact what happens. But the beautiful thing is, is that you don't make the journey alone. There have been so many people <coughs> who made the journey with me and who've been involved in, um, in, in parts of the process as, as we went along and have inspired uh, me. So therefore, there are a huge number of people to thank. Um, I would like to thank Peter Knight and Paul Freeman for getting me to Imperial College and asking me to establish the ultrafast laboratory and, and really helping with uh, making it uh, come true. This is the ultrafast lab today. And this is where, when at home, we uh, spend our days and, um, of course, there are people in it who are my wonderful group, and I need to thank them really very strongly. Uh, they are wonderful and very talented people who have joined me uh, in, um, in everything that we have developed and that we are, that we are doing. So you can see them in action uh, right here. Then I also want to finish by, uh, by mentioning that there isn't enough space to thank everybody. I did find these beautiful pictures um, of people who were in the group and uh, spent time in our laboratory. The list goes on and on and on. There's uh, people watching, uh, I know right now, Pradeep, hey. um, and, uh, and so I thank everybody who took part in this, in this journey. Um, with me. I want to thank profusely the department, the colleagues in the department. I want to uh, thank Anne for the support and uh, the support, uh, supporting environment. I want to thank all my friends and colleagues in physics and chemistry departments um, that, we, that we also collaborate with. And finally, um, I hope that I have spoken to your physics engines, and in fact, if you ask me the question in Q&A, I can prove to you your physics engine. I can prove that everybody here 
will automatically perform a procedure known as normal mode decomposition of molecular vibration just by watching moving images that you would have to ask. And I want to finish by thanking you for coming. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jasper, for an absolutely amazing presentation. I want to know why my physics engine means that I can never quite work out how to park a car in between two other cars when I'm doing parallel parking, and it never, ever works. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, who would like to start off? We have roving people with microphones, so just raise your hand. You're allowed to ask anything personal, professional. Jasper, I am sure, will be happy to answer. Can you prove that which assertion? The, the one about us being able to use our... Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Here goes. This is an undergraduate question, which I do it in, in uh, undergraduate lectures. Our oxygen is bound in a protein hemoglobin and carried to our tissues for respiration. And so this is the O2 molecule there. And uh, it's bound at this site there um, between a heme and a histidine. Now, we can make the most simple model, which is one dimensional. We say this is the oxygen, and we replace the bonds with springs. Yes? If we just assume that. Now I'm going to show you a movie. which is the classical mechanics representation of the quantum mechanical thing, but still. Watch it going on. It's quite a complicated motion, isn't it? So you're watching it, and you're watching it. What are you thinking? If I can ask you to find which ingredients are sufficient to describe this motion, and how many? Then your brain has already done it. There's two. Going sideways and compressing stretching from centrally. And anything else is just a linear combination of this. You all got that, right? Now, what your brain has actually done is this. <coughs> uh, we are using, uh, we, uh, no, it's true. Uh, we are writing two Lagrangian equations, which uh, takes uh, Newton's second and third laws, yes. And Lagrangian mechanics uh, rewrote this in a nice way, but we have to write two, uh, because we simplify it, um, to make this one the same as that one. And so we have to solve two simultaneous equations. Then there are derivatives, because like the high jumper who computes the time derivative of momentum and the position derivative of, of potential energy, um, we solve this in differential equations. And there we go. We have to go. We use uh, complex numbers. And we differentiate once. We def differentiate twice. We get solutions. Then it's not finished. <coughs> Then we uh, make major omissions and use um, uh, uh, algebra equations that uh, we rewrite in matrix form the same problem. Now it's a product of matrices. This is called linear algebra. And um, then um, we uh, solve this problem by major omissions. Again, I'm not showing the proof that the determinant must be zero for this problem to discard the trivial case of one of the matrices being zero. So we calculate the determinant, and we get two solutions for two frequencies. There they are. And then we plug back in, and we get the anti-symmetric and the symmetric motion, which I've just shown you. And there will be an examination on this before you leave. <laughs> uh, just here. Oh, I'm here.
you are from statistics department, and my question is, can you actually verify your model, like the, or model the motion that you described in the model against real data? Do you have data which you allow me to test your model? Uh, you mean the, the oxygen? No, 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 but which one? I've, I've shown you many motions of electrons and nuclei today. Which motion do you want me to? Or anyone you can. Anyone. Um, when I said in the beginning that the problem of motion of a, of a macromolecule is already, is already so complex that you have to be an experimentalist, then I've proven it with the movies I've just shown you because there's no computational method that will have predicted that result. There isn't, it doesn't exist. Not even the highest level of quantum mechanics can do that. And so theory for us, we, I actually spent more time on theory to understand my experiment. I'm an experimentalist, but I spent all my time computing and writing uh, uh, the, the mathematics and what I, what I want to try and, and capture. So there is a, a, a gap, a disconcern between the experiment and the theory. And very often, this is the point that, that life is so complicated that I must choose to work at the level of the motion of a single macromolecule, where I can't even begin to fathom the locomotion of the, of, of the organism. See? I, I don't know. That's a metaphysical answer to your um, <laughs> if I can write a... Uh, the thing is that there is a, a theory of statistical inference to be discovered which will allow you to match what you are observing against underlying theoretical models. That well, um, so I, I hope to do this soon. For instance, I've just completed the, the, the full theory for all crystal symmetries of four-wave mixing coherences in... Uh, in yeah. In, uh, in, in that type of experiment, they are predictions based on theory, and I'm now going to go ahead and try to measure them. So that's actually the correct way to do it. If you develop something that doesn't exist, uh, then I would prefer to do the calculation, which is a prediction first, and then make a measurement later, and I hope I was right, <laughs> because it's going to be published. So. Many proteins are, are floppy in their function. Right and have taken on very many conformers. Right. And when you put them in the, in, the, in the crystal, presumably you're restricting many of those motions. So how do you, how do you connect the, 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 in the long run the, the conclusions from studying them when they're restricted by the crystal? Uh, uh, how can you predict how that would translate to their function inside solution? Yes, so this, uh, in crystallographic data, this translates to the, the Bayer-Waller factor, which um, basically spreads out the electron density. We know that they are showing contributions from the lowest frequencies only. Um, if you compute the RMS displacements using the quantum oscillator, which many people still use, the classical one, but then you see that it's them that are responsible for it. So the, um, that, that's a physical measurement of the magnitude of low frequency, you call it floppy, but they are the terahertz modes that, um, that are statically averaged in a crystal structure. And it's precisely the modifications of, of, these, uh, of these low frequency modes that we are seeing in some of the disorder signals where a negative electron density isn't matched by positive, it's, it's, a, it's an increase in disorder. Uh, and we know this to be true because um, the phonon wing is, is known to have very large Huan Ries factors, and they very strongly mix into uh, non adiabatic uh, electron phonon coupling. So that fits with everything we know. Um, right, we have three hands going up. Um, white shirt first. Thank you very much. Um, so, this model that we used assumes um, constant spring stiffnesses, which, which we use a lot. I, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of civil engineering department here in earthquake engineering, and we use very similar models. Um, like Caesar. <laughs> but uh, at a, even at a molecular level, 
We have, you, you have no qualms using linear spring stiffness as a, do we have evidence about its validity? It, it is completely wrong to do molecular dynamics calculation and disregard our quantization. It's completely wrong. If you cool a molecule down to low temperature, then the uncertainty principle tells us that there is fluctuations there. That's the zero point energy, and that's the, that's the motion in the lowest energy, the difference between the quantum description and the classical description. Um, so if you warm up something that is as low force constant, you will thermally occupy uh, <coughs> quantum levels, uh, and um, depends whether you are interested in the differences between uh, the classical harmonic oscillator and the quantum one. Um, but there are some ap approximations that, that are helpful um, to use classical mechanics sometimes, but I would say they are mostly not correct. But it, it helps in this case, right? I've shown, I've proven to you that it provides the same normal modes in, that, that are actually measured spectroscopically of the molecule, of the molecular dynamics. So some things are useful. Um, so my question um, has, uh, has to do with your um, research, with uh, your uh, sort of expected research in solar cells. Um, yeah. So I was wondering um, what materials you'll be looking at and what, what sort of you hope, the, uh, what direction you hope the research will take you in and what you hope to see. What is uh, new in the work that I do is the, um, is the optical response in crystalline environment. And solar cell research is solid state physics. That is not my background. But uh, a single crystal solar cell material like perovskites um, provides for me the opportunity to make a molecular movie of electronic dynamics using these four wave mixing techniques um, that can be very helpful in what is, what is occurring on femtosecond timescales. That doesn't exist yet. So I'm looking to translate into a new area where the experts can tell me what the photophysics are, and I'm interested in a femtosecond optical crystallographic experiment that is useful for uh, the human race. We have time for one more question, up three quarters or halfway up. Thank you. Hi. Is there any way of visualizing um, enzyme catalysis using any approach? Uh, this is um, actively going on, of course. Uh, it, it must fall solidly in the kinetics time domain where the time of observation provides you with concentrations. And so the motion itself uh, is only accessible through ultra-fast perturbation. There is the potential of terahertz pumping, and uh, the electric field, but we'll see. Uh, Stark shift uh, is another method the application of electrical fields at very high potentials, they are well known and studied in Stark field spectroscopy and they, they create nuclear motion on the time scale as fast as you can apply the electric field. And it, will, it is going to be even more challenging than the type of work that I do that are optical laser initiated to to get into the coherent time domain to reach, to act, to observe the true motion, which is more elusive than you think, even for my methods. So it <coughs> give us 20 more years. Right, so on that note, thank you very much indeed, Jasper. Um, we now have... I now have the pleasure of introducing Professor Paul Champion from Northeastern University in Boston, who will give the vote of thanks. Okay, well, um, 
This is not something we normally do in the U.S., but I think we should start off with a nice round of applause, thanking Jasper for a wonderful talk. And um, I'd like to personally uh, add my thank you for bringing me to this wonderful event. You guys have a wonderful place here and a great neighborhood. I was walking around Kensington Gardens, and I visited the uh, monument to physical energy. If you, any of you know that? Um, it's a guy on a horse. You know, it's all, all that dynamic. Good place to get your Hamiltonian straightened out if you're. That's an inside joke for quantum mechanics out there. Um, but. Let me just say uh, how I met Jasper. Uh, it, it goes back uh, maybe 15 years, I'm not sure. I think he was still at Oxford at the time. And he was visiting uh, our lab at Northeastern, actually not my lab, but my colleague's lab, Tim, Tim Sage. And Tim uh, uh, mentioned to me that there was this crystallographer coming. And he was working on green fluorescent protein. And what I like to meet him. So I met Jasper. And it was great. And um, Time evolved, and I just had him sort of, sort of pegged as a crystallographer. Uh, but then uh, we had developed a, a, a workshop out in Telluride, Colorado, uh, the Telluride Science uh, 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 Research Conferences. And um, uh, Jasper came to one of those. Um, this is maybe three or four years later, maybe less. I don't remember. The time kind of blurs when you get to be my age. But uh, at that conference, I realized that, in fact, Jasper was m much more than a crystallographer. He was working uh, in time-resolved re time uh, spectroscopy in the infrared, which is a lot closer to the kinds of things that I was doing. And we kind of uh, hit up a, a made, you know, kind of a collaboration and started talking. And uh, actually, Jasper nudged me into writing a proposal uh, it was really a joint proposal to the National Science Foundation and the uh, European Physical Science Research Council, I think, and we got a joint grant to study GFP. And we were, um, of course, interested in these excited state uh, proton transfer reactions uh, where you, a photon comes in and kicks a, kicks a proton uh, uh, to another spot in the system, and then the green light comes out. And so we. We, we took it upon ourselves to, to work together uh, with our different techniques. And we found something very surprising, um, actually not at all what we were setting out to investigate uh, in the excited state. We actually found ground state uh, proton tunneling at room temperature takes place very rapidly uh, in about 400 picoseconds. And um, I guess I'm going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow in, in, the, uh, in the physics department. But it just uh, goes to show how inter interdisciplinary work is, is so important and how somebody like Jasper, who's a very rare find, who um, works both in crystallography uh, and in ultrafast laser science, uh, which are fairly disparate fields. And uh, he's, he's worked in both, and he's become kind of an experimental master of both. And that's very, very unusual. Most people, uh, like me, kind of get tied down to our equipment and our apparatus, and, and we kind of get stuck doing, doing one thing. We might move on and move, do something else later, but it's very hard to do these two things simultaneously, and um, two, two things so technically challenging. And Jasper is a pretty unique individual in that he can do both of those things. And he's really bringing uh, these fields together um, and working on, uh, on very important and insightful pro uh, problems. I, took one from the lecture uh, that I found very uh, interesting, and I hope he can succeed, is looking at electronic coherences. This is a very timely uh, topic in photosynthesis. There's some very controversial results out there, and the kind of thing that Jasper is proposing to do, I think, uh, might help to uh, resolve some of those controversies. And the other thing uh, actually goes to Sandy Ruman's question over here uh, about whether the crystallographic structure can constrain the motion of the proteins. Uh, if, if Jasper can see the low frequency motions inside of a crystal, uh, which would be a huge achievement, then you can compare those to the low frequency motions in a solution and find maybe the answer to your question, whether those are, are very similar or very different. And I think that would be a hugely important advance if you can do it. And I think you're poised uh, to to do that, Jasper. You're, you're, you're right, right in the right place, maybe uniquely. Um, 
So uh, what else was I going to say? Well, I just wanted to say that this interdisciplinary stuff is very, very important. Jasper is uh, a, a, a real expert in this. And I really want to thank you uh, for the whole scientific community, because you can bring these different fields together. Sometimes these fields actually compete for funding, but Jasper has his feet in both, <laughs> in both ponds. And so he, he brings people together that way. And there's a cross-fertilization that takes place that is really what moves science forward. Um, so I wanted to just close by by saying, I guess there's a vote involved. Are we supposed to, is this a vote? it said vote of thanks on my, on my, are we all gonna vote Jasper? Jasper's a great guy, right? And a great scientist. And we wanna thank you for that. And I think I'm supposed to push a button here, because the, uh, this one, space bar. And uh, again, thank you, and let's go have a drink and uh, pat him on the back for a great lecture. It was really, really nice. That was it. You can now relax.